Hello and welcome. My name is Emma Gauthier, and I'm a researcher with the Community Broadband Networks Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. The event today is hosted by the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. This is the second event in the Tribal Broadband Webinar Series, which dives into what it takes to run a tribal broadband network. A link to the first event, which focused on the high-level considerations of building a tribal broadband network, will be posted in the chat shortly. Uh, today, we'll be focusing on wireless networks. But first, uh, a quick word about our sponsor. The webinar today is brought to you by Waska Wewin, which is a nonprofit organization comprised of a loose collection of people with a long history of building and encouraging non-traditional broadband networks. Waska Wewin builds broadband capacity in Indian country by inspiring people to create and work at tribal internet service providers in their own communities. It aims to demystify technology, law, and policy, and it helps tribes build up their workforce development while gaining more control over their digital futures. Waska Wewin is also the parent organization for our tribal broadband boot camps, which you may have heard of. Um, these are in-person, multi-day events that strive to create an open and supportive culture that is conducive to building the trust that we need to continue this challenging work long into the future. The next Tribal Broadband Bootcamp, which will be our 10th one already, uh, will be focused, uh, will be hosted by the Tahana Atham Utility Authority and will take place on from January, January 29th, excuse me, to February 1st of next year. Registration just opened for that one, so you can go and fill out an inquiry form on tribalbroadbandbootcamp.org, and we'll put that in the chat. A second boot camp will be hosted in Southern California from March 10th to 13th, 2024. Um, and that one will be focused on advanced fiber. Because that one is more advanced, we ask that those interested in attending apply on tribalbroadbandbootcamp.org. So the link that we'll put in the chat will take you to a Google form where you can select the bootcamp you're interested in and you can learn more about the event there. Uh, a couple logistics, a recording of this event will live both on the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's YouTube and at tribalbroadbandbootcamp.org along with all past and future webinars in this series. So please check that out and share it with other people. And finally, uh, feel free to post questions in the chat because we'll have some time at the end to get to those. So with that, we'll get right into the content of the panel. So I'll bring on our panelists. Hello, how are you all doing? Good. Good. All right, so I just wanna focus on, um, Let's turn first to introductions. So, uh, Monica, could you just talk a little bit about yourself and your relationship to wireless? Absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Everything sound good? Yes. Thanks so much for uh, including me in this discussion today. So I'm a project specialist at Amarind Critical Infrastructure. And um, some of you in the audience might be familiar with the Amarind name because we are the only uh, tribally owned uh, insurance company in the United States. And inside of uh, Amerind, the insurance company, we have a, um, a group called Amerind Critical Infrastructure that provides grant writing, resources, uh, logistics, project management. And I, um, I've had the opportunity to work on several uh, grants as well as um, ACI itself uh, helped with uh, obtaining a number of um, 2.5 licenses for tribes uh, during the the rural tribal broadband window, where there were a lot of um, a lot of folks who were trying to figure out what they wanted to, whether or not they wanted to apply for these uh, 2.5 licenses that were available for tribes. So that's a little bit of my experience with wireless and um, with this particular topic. And um, I should say that I'm Assiniboine and Papa Lakota. Great, thank you, Monica. Next we have Spagy or Matthew Douglas, depending on how you know him. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Matthew Douglas. I decided to kind of go by Spaggy in the broadband world because there's always like another Matt in the room. Um, but I am the broadband manager for the Hoopa Valley Public Utilities District in Northern California. Um, I am a Hoopa tribal member and um, let's see, we started our journey, I think it was August of 2020, just after the pandemic kind of uh, was in full swing and we, uh, the Hoopa Valley tribe didn't really have a, um, a wire or broadband offering before this, previous to this. So we kind of started from the ground up. Um, there were several attempts before and we kind of took advantage of some of the resources that were, I guess, remnants of that. Uh, and we, I guess my experience in wireless is started um, by bringing in a, I believe it's a, 60 mile wireless backhaul with four different um, relay sites to get internet into Hoopa. And then we built three distribution sites within the valley to try and connect homes. Um, and that was a crash course with consultants and some of my background was in IT infrastructure um, and starting a business just in general. So we're pretty, pretty fresh to this um but but yeah that's my experience with uh wireless thanks and next we have kristen hi good afternoon my name is kristen johnson and i'm the telephone operations manager for the thonal at the utility authority we provide um, communication and wireless service to the thonal at the indian reservation located in southwest arizona we serve approximately 4,400 square miles with about um, 3,800 subscribers. We um, also applied for the 2.5 spectrum and received it for our tribe and have built out that portion um, in 2020. And we are now um, completing the second um, portion of it, which is the unlicensed spectrum to feed um, certain parts of our, res our reservation that currently have wireless. Perfect, thank you. All right, I wanna start with um, a little bit of a basic discussion um, of what it looks like to get started with a wireless network. Um, and I wanna ask you three about job responsibilities. What, what does it actually look like to work and build and maintain um, a wireless network. So what what job roles exist? And I know this might be different for Spaggy than it is for Kristen because of the size of your ISPs. Um, so just what is good wireless practice when you first start? We can start with um, Spaggy. Okay. Um, well, for us, I can kind of just tell the story of of like how we um, and kind of started it. Um, obviously, we didn't have all of the information of like, like all the knowledge, I guess, to be able to deploy on our own. So we brought in consultants. Um, uh, the skill sets that we saw within those consultants that we wanted to try and take over first was most likely like the installation of homes um, and the management of the CPEs or customer premise equipment. Um, we went with the Cambium build out and they have in the wireless world, there's just names galore. So that was one of the, you know, hurdles that we had to come with is learning all the names, but, um, like, so they use SM for subscriber module, but it turned out that one of the first positions, um, that we wanted to employ was a broadband technician. And that was kind of at the, the basic level of um, what we needed and from the consultant they were tasked with learning how to install the cpes or the sms at the home that was the optimal way to do it um, we leaned heavily on the consultants to help us put up sectors and the network the initial like um, routing network and routing and switching network 
Um, so then the next thing was for myself to learn a little bit more about routing and switching and maintaining a network. Um, and they, the consultant helped us do that. Um, the next skill set that we kind of learned on our own was how to maintain those wireless, um, uh, I guess, sectors that go on the towers. Um, but the, I guess, so the skill set is um, on the advanced side, networking and wireless, um, understanding frequencies and um, how to set up sectors. And then the, the primary role to learn was the broadband technician. And we found that somebody that was like a gamer in the construction world was actually pretty a, a good candidate for being a good broadband technician. Um, and if they had experience rock climbing, um, we also were fortunate enough to find a tribal member that had previous wireless experience. So we were able to bring him on. He brought some good experience into the team as well. But um, not to, I mean, there's obviously this, this can keep, we can keep going up, but those were the, the first steps for us. Yeah, that's a great start. Thank you. Uh, Kristen? So, um, like mentioned, you know, it's different for everybody. And fortunately for us, when we got into wireless, we, we you know, we're a telecom already. So we had technicians and we um, already had a fiber. We started our fiber build out. So um, on our reservation, all of our telephone services are underground. So wireless is, of course, you know, on poles. And um, that was one of the things we had to accomplish was to get climbers, certified climbers. And for the 3.65 portion or the unlicensed spectrum, um, you know, we had to get people certified. And then the bucket trucks, we had to have people um, with CDLs so that they could move some of the equipment, get the buckets um, erected in the air to be able to help with some of the items, the installation. Um, we, we deployed a buy cells um, solution um, from start to finish. And one of the, you know, the, the biggest thing is being able to, you know, balance the two. Um, and we use the wireless for redundance, redundancy um, because pr um, our fibers are primary way of communicating and then um, having the wireless within the communities or the villages, we still call, have ours as villages, um, to be able to provide something more global to the communities and the students or home health care workers. Um, but mainly the technicians. Um, and then we have a central office on our telephone side, and then we have the ISP. And they were able to work hand in hand to get the networking and bring, you know, kind of everything together. So I wouldn't say it was easy, but it was easier than starting from, you know, ground up day one, not knowing a whole lot of things. And um, we leaned heavily on our engineering company to um, do the design and to just kind of walk us through. But um, also with buy cells, they came out and helped us do a whole lot of, of the installation and understanding and technical support in, um, an area in the areas that we weren't familiar with. Thank you. So when you were hiring for those initial roles, were you writing the job descriptions or did you have that from your existing, um, service that you were already providing, Kristen? We we use we just incorporated the tasks into our um, because we have installer repair technicians and we have combination technicians. So we just added, I don't want to say the other duty as a sign, but we added it to the list of duties and responsibilities for um, the different areas in our central office or our outside plant or or the IT. And, and now more now not because they have to be able to um, troubleshoot and and prep everything before the installers or the the technicians take thing take the equipment out for installation. Okay. And Spaggy, were you writing your own job descriptions, or was there somewhere you got job descriptions from? Yeah, we um, we utilized a service called um, uh, onetonline.org, and it was a free resource to kind of look. And then we also had a contract with Amrin who helped us write some of our job descriptions. So it was a combination of two different resources. Um, but uh, the hardest thing was finding like relevant pay because this is the first time that we've seen this type of position. And 
um, were pretty rural, so there wasn't a lot of examples to go off of. Um, but yeah, so we wrote them ourselves pretty much um, with those two resources. Monica, would you be able to speak a little bit to the services that Amron is able to provide in terms of writing job descriptions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're pretty versatile. Uh, if our clients ask us for something, if we ourselves don't know the answer to it, we usually go and uh, solicit using our networks and things like that. So we've done all kinds of things from writing grants to writing job descriptions to checking on you know the pay and uh, in that area or um, even writing terms of service uh, documents so that the wireless networks don't you know have somebody who's signed up who understands the the rules of um, the services that they're getting and and things like that um, yeah we, we're we're pretty versatile and <laughs> flexible in terms of needs a lot of project management, a lot of like following up and making sure that we're meeting the regulations, that we're making the grant requirements, things like that. Thank you. Uh, the next thing I want to move to is talking about what it takes to maintain a 2.5 gigahertz license. So maybe let's start with just a one to two minute introduction of what it means to have a license and maybe even a little bit of basic info about the tribal priority window. Um, Kristen, do you want to take that? Just explain what the window is and then what it takes to maintain that license. Right. So when we um, applied for the license, like I mentioned, we, we kind of had some resources and were able to get a jump start and be able to deploy um, and get our license and, and meet all of the requirements pretty quickly. So we didn't face a whole lot of, um, or need to elaborate or go into so much of what the requirements were. You know, like I said, we, we had, we already had a weaker, I don't know, it wasn't as good of a wireless system in the villages already. So we were just changing out equipment um, but it is important to maintain um, so that it, it doesn't go back into recycle. And like I mentioned, we um, some of our reservation was already covered and the spectrum wasn't available. So we we had to provide an uh, we are going to be providing an unlicensed um, portion to those individuals and be able to marry the two together so that um it, it doesn't matter on the on the subscriber side, but to us, we're able to stay in compliance with the um, requirements of holding the license, and then also to be able to deploy and 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 make it legit. But I, I really didn't have a whole lot of involvement in in the license. I mean, we filed, and you know, our company was good. It's it's was only took us a few months to get that all taken care of. Great, thank you. I'm gonna pass to Monica now to give us a little um, additional context. Yeah, this is definitely something that like, I, I feel like Indian country when these, when these tribal broadband priority windows opened up, Indian country became, quickly had to learn to become experts on this, right? And so, some of the things that I learned um, when I started this job was that these licenses normally, when you have a spectrum license, uh, often you are actually purchasing these licenses, right? And um, sometimes you have to go to auction and the FCC is the, the main person, main um, organization in control of these licenses. But we had this incredible opportunity several years ago where the, when the 2.5 spectrum opened up because it was originally um, reserved for education and then they wanted to open it up for auction. But before they opened it up for auction, they gave tribes a chance to apply for them across their if if the spectrum was across their reservation and um and so a number of tribes and and in the beginning there was a there was really a question 
about um, what what am I going to do with this? What can I do with this? And uh, there was basically a lot of um, opportunities is what uh, these spectrum licenses provide for you. So if you want to build out um, and you want to use it to build out a wireless network, you can use it for that. Or um, if you wanted to lease it out, you could lease it out and it could actually become an income uh, income rev revenue uh, for for your tribe. So what what happened is that tribes filled out uh, basically these applications and they were granted what's called a construction permit. And there's two levels of requirements that you need to meet before you can transition from a construction permit to fully having the 2.5 license. And this is where most tribes are right now, is that they are in the construction permit process and they are building out. And so some of the requirements, let's just say for the interim, the requirements to build out basically mean that you need to, 50% um, of the population coverage for a mobile or point to multi-point service, or 20 links per million, um, one link per 50,000, or 50% 50 population coverage for broadcast service. So that's the, the minimum requirement for the interim build out. And the way that you show that is it's, it's pretty technical. I've had a conversation with the FCC about it, and we can provide um, more information about that. But essentially what you're doing is proving that you are meeting uh, one of those three requirements in terms of serving the population. Um, and you do that with a variety of things like engineering reports and maps and things like that, right? And so um, that's essentially building out the, um, the process that you go to from getting a construction permit to actually having the license. So then once you have the license, the FCC requires that you, um, you're granted this license for 10 years, and then you have to apply for it again after 10 years. And you need to certify that you have been meeting the requirements that you're serving the number of people that, or, or the, um, however you set it up, that you're serving um, the folks that you agreed you were serving for, for this license. I know, um, Speggy, did you want to jump in on this uh, this section? Because I know you're you're in this process, right? Um, of of yeah, build we, out. Yeah, we've we've completed the build out. We just need to do the reporting, I believe, back to the FCC to let them know because uh, the population of Hoopa is thirty five hundred. So we pretty much satisfied the the one house per. Uh, 20 homes per million with one customers, right? So we have roughly 90 customers, I believe, that are on the 2.5 gigahertz frequency. And um, yeah, so what we found though is um, just kind of jumping into the wireless world and with that mapping, um, we can show the FCC heat maps and it pretty much shows that we have really awesome coverage throughout our region. But what we're learning kind of, or what we've learned um, the hard way in a way um, with wireless is that just because you have coverage doesn't mean that the signal quality is adequate. So um, we're learning something about what they call like the, the wireless tool belt, if you will, where you can't solve the, the need of your community with just one frequency. It's not a one and done type of situation. So um, we started with uh, the 2.5 gigahertz frequency and five gigahertz frequency, um, five gigahertz being unlicensed. And then um, we recently made the jump into um, the 3.65 gigahertz frequency or CBRS. Um, we actually deployed our first unit at, I forget what boot camp that was, but it was a treble broadband boot camp five, I think. Um, and so the characteristics of uh, the different frequencies, so 
So five gigahertz is probably the fastest frequency that we have for our customers. Um, the problem is it can't make it through trees. Um, as soon as you get a couple of leaves in front of it, it's um, pretty much useless. <laughs> um, with the 365, it can make it a little bit deeper, but it still has some limitations. And what's awesome about the 2.5 is it has really good penetration into the trees. So it's very useful for those people that are pretty far back in, into a tree line, uh, which is common in our area. And there are other frequencies that you can get a little bit lower. Um, there's one 900 megahertz, um, which is sub one gigahertz. And that one could make it through a lot of trees. Um, so as, from a wireless perspective, you have this tool belt of, okay, this is the area that I'm trying to get service to. What frequency am I gonna pull out of that tool belt to try and serve it? Um, and there's a lot of different considerations of population density, and um, non-line of sight interferers. So things that are blocking the unit at the home to the sector. But all of this is, you know, that we've learned in the last three years of how to kind of utilize that tool belt. Um, but long story short on the 2.5, it, it is one of our better tools to use. So, um, and having access to it has been, um, really awesome for our deployment. The majority of our customers are on it because of the topology and makeup of our area. Thank you. So relatedly, we have a question in the chat um, for Kristen. If you're already deploying 2.5 gigahertz, what is the benefit of doing the unlicensed 3.65 gigahertz? The benefit of um, deploying the 3.65 I mean, is for the uh, the villages that um, aren't available to us in this in the 2.5 spectrum, so that they're able to have wireless, um, it it is the certain sections were already allocated under the um, I think it was like an educational broad or educational some type of educational spectrum, and so we're having to deploy the the three dot the 3.65 so that all of our tribal members and all of the villages have some type of wireless service um, through us under the same platform and can still have um, a, a redundant path, you know, um, for their copper or their fiber. Thank you. So now I want to go into a little bit more of a general discussion about use of the license. So um, let's start with Spaggy. Maybe what does it take to one maintain the network and use that license? So, um, utilization of the license once you get um, so you, you get a frequency planner to help you out with this. Um, it's not something that um, typically somebody has in house, but you have to register the initial location, the azimuth, or the direction, and the tilt and the total power output you're putting on a sector. But once you get that registered, it's pretty much um, just maintaining an active network connection to that site where the equipment's located. Um, that could be, you know, fiber or wireless backhauls to that location, whether or not, you know, getting kind of nerdy, you know, whether or not you want a layer two or layer three network um, to interface with keeping those systems on a network monitoring system so that you can track like whether or not um, the system's up, down, if certain services are up or down. And, and that's like more on like the technology side of maintaining that site. But what we learned is actually one of the more critical aspects is power and having enough uh, battery backup power so that when you have an influx of, or, or I guess the power goes out, you have enough time on your backup power system to react. So if you have a generator that takes a few seconds to kick over, you, you would think, oh, I only need a few seconds of battery life so that when the generator kicks on, you know, it powers my system. Well, that doesn't give you a lot of time to react if the generator has like an oil leak or something that you need to repair. So um, what we've been 
recommended to build, which we're planning to build, is what like a 72-hour backup power type of solution for each of our sites. And, and that's been the primary maintenance aside from that initial like licensing of the 2.5 is just keeping the system operating um, both on the network side and the power side. Um, and one other component, I guess, is um, making, uh, you don't really have this problem in the unlicensed, I mean, in the licensed space as much, but in the unlicensed space, you could have interferers. So somebody might put up a Wi-Fi unit next to your thing that speaks on the 2.5 or 2.4, sorry, um, which uh, 2.4 and 2.5 frequencies are kind of close together. So there's is some potential if the if the Wi-Fi router is not tuned properly that it could still bleed into the 2.5 a little bit and cause some interference. So monitoring interference levels is another component. And unfortunately, with the Cambium gear that we had, it didn't initially have that functionality. So we were we didn't know if there was an interferer. Um, and T-Mobile is in the area, so and they they won the bid for most. Like I think it was something like ninety five percent of the two point five frequency. So there is a potential that there is somebody that's bleeding into your system. You just gotta um, um, monitor that. Those are the three components that I think it's taken, um, which is network power and interference. Thank you. Oh, Kristen, I want to go to you now. I know you use wireless as a redundant measure. Um, and so the number of subscribers on your network fluctuates a little bit. Could you talk more about um, why you decided to make that decision, what it brings to the network, how it's helpful for you? Okay, so we we made this choice for several reasons. Like I mentioned, we we had copper 100% to all of our subscribers. Um, and then we were able, we were fortunate enough to get a lot of grants to build fiber. Um, when the spectrum came um, became available, um, we asked the tribe if we, um, as an entity of the tribe, were able to go after and apply for it. So when we when we they approved us to do that we applied we we there were some stipulations that bring it back and then we'll decide you know what toua can use and and to fulfill like the the homes the households and then um a portion would go to um health and then the tribe itself so having those things in mind and building the network well because the Fiber to the home, of course, is the best, you know, way to connect. And sometimes um, our customers don't requ don't request a blue stake, or um, something happens, you know, in the you know they're building something, somebody hits something, or further down it goes out. We're able to roll over and keep them in service on using the the wireless. So we decided instead of not making it appear that we didn't need it um, as much as maybe others would, that we would incorporate it into a redundancy for us so that we had very, or well, our consumers would have very minimal outage experiences um, and be able to, because some of the villages, um, they're not you know, in close proximity, like I mentioned, we're 4,400 square miles. Some of the villages are two hours, you know, away in one direction. So we're able to just switch them over and, and you know, have it on standby. So that was one of the reasons that um, we chose to do this. And then in some cases now where um, they're on copper, you know, we're very limited on how much, um, or what speed we're able to give these consumers or the students in the homes um, to connect to the internet and the wireless, um, we can push, you know, higher broadband speeds off of that. So we we choose to use that in the interim while we build them fiber. And then when the fiber's built, then we'll use the wireless as a redundant for that. So in some cases it's the primary connection um, but in a lot of cases, it's the backup in case something happens to the fiber. 
Thank you. So there's also the question of what to do with a wireless license after um, fiber is installed, if that is the end goal. So Monica, could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, uh, Kristen, thank you so much for sharing all of that. It's definitely the biggest question that I had as I've been helping tribes, um, whether it's getting these licenses um, to set up a WISP um, and then applying for these grants to do full fiber build out to the homes. I, I want folks to think ahead. What are you going to do with that license? Because, um, you know, I, I had a meeting with the FCC and I, I and after this, I can share the links to the rulemaking process and, and things like that. But, but essentially, if you have a disconnection of your uh, service that's a uh, over 180 days, then you are putting your license at risk. And so if you stop using it after you've built fiber to the home, um, you may have to turn that license back and then it'll go up for auction where anyone can have it. And ideally that is not something that I would advise tribes do. They want, this is your, um, this is your spectrum in your, on your land, and uh, you should have a choice in terms of how it's used. So, um, so that's basically, you know, when I checked in with the FCC, I wanted to know what kind of options do tribes have as they build out fiber to the home, and having it as a redundancy is an excellent. Um, option and probably what a lot of tribes will um, choose to do. I do know that as uh, broadband money rolls out and um, folks are using uh, tribal broadband connectivity program money, there is some concerns. Uh, uh, they don't like the word redundant, right? Because you don't want to be overbuilding. You don't want to have two um, two options essentially even though that we both we all know that um, having those things uh, pr just provides a better experience for the customers and in some cases is uh, a safety concern being able to have that backup if the fiber gets cut and while you're re-splicing the fiber and things like that being able to have the wireless up and running so um what you can do is that uh, what was shared with me is that this is flexible use spectrum. So you can change the way that you use the spectrum. So, for example, right now, if you're uh, using it to provide out to um, the villages that don't have access or you don't have any fiber to them, but then you do build fiber out to them, you can use it as a point to point link for backhaul. Um, as one option. And essentially all you need to do is just uh, inform the FCC about how you are changing the use and then just demonstrate that you're still meeting the final build out requirements um, for the spectrum. The other things that you can do is you can lease your 2.5 license. So you will need to go through the FCC to lease it out. You can lease it out to, for example, um, a wireless provider um, or a cell phone provider. And um, you're able to lease it out if you haven't met your full um, build out requirements, because as I mentioned before, it's 50% of the population coverage for mobile or point to po point to multi-point service. Um, for the final build out, it's 80% population coverage. So at the 50%, you can um, lease out your spectrum if you want. Um, but if you want to sell the spectrum, you definitely need to have it completely built full out 80% before you can sell it. Um, and uh, I just wanted to point out that the first round of licenses that were granted, the deadline to meet the interim is actually going to be in 2024, in October of 2024. So um, those are a couple of options that I have uh, researched. And then I want, um, I want to pass it over to uh, Speggy because I think he's working on something that's really interesting and might be a really great option for tribes. 
gotta, gotta unmute. <laughs> um, so the, I guess the Hoopa Valley tribe has been fortunate enough to get enough funding in around uh, the NTIA travel broadband connectivity program round one to build fiber to every home. So we've already been trying to look at what can we do with 2.5 um, after the, you know, everybody gets um, internet in their house. But one of the, the components to that is um, funding. Um, how do we get the funding to build a wireless system when it's considered redundant because we already have fiber to every home? So one, I guess, avenue that we're trying to go down is the emergency services route where um, we're trying to look into FEMA programs to offer E911 services throughout the tribe and utilizing the 2.5 frequency to accomplish that. Um, we do have three cell phone providers in the region, but they tend to have like a fiduciary responsibility to, you know, if they're serving most of the community, then they're good. But that's not our stance on it. We want to get 100% of our community to be able to call 911 wherever they're at. So it's, we've been, um, uh, I guess, looking at how can we partner or or accomplish this with the carriers in one avenue and um uh so one of the fears that we have with e911 and for those that don't know what e911 is it's the ability to call 911 on your cell phone and it actually go to like a semi-local regional call center um instead of going to like uh, a call center hundreds of miles away, for example. Um, so what we want to do with that is um, what's called um, a MOKIN, uh, multi-operator core network. And what that allows us to do is, in a, in a traditional sense, how it's done is we'll lease space on a tower to a carrier, and then the carrier will then, if they're interested, they'll buy that space and they'll emit their own signal. Um, Moken's a little bit different in the sense that we will put our own equipment on that tower and emit the signal, and then they have like a virtual parallel network to ours where they'll be emitted on the same frequency. And it's kind of considered um, another term for it's like neutral host where um, we built the hardware, but we can have Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, whatever carrier on that signal, and they can serve um, in parallel. So that allows them to offer that E911 services in more regions because it's more cost effective method because everybody's sharing the same um, infrastructure cost. Um, and we've also been considering becoming our own cell phone provider, but then there are legal implications in that that we would not 100% sure with such a small and rural community how we're gonna handle that cost, but it's still something to look into um, and we're going through that. But we find that funding wise, there's more opportunity for us to advance the 2.5 frequency on the emergency side of things rather than on the broadband connecting data side of things. So. That, that's one of the reasons why we've been focusing on that route. That's really great. Yeah. Um, so I want to shift to where you all are now. I know, Spike, you talked about kind of up and coming projects. I'm wondering if, if Kristen, you would be able to just give us like a status update on where you are now and anything you have looking ahead to the future. Okay, so I, I wanted to go back on the utilization portion. Um, so we also are um, rested against about 70 miles of US Mexico Mexican border. So in the utilization of, of the licenses too, we have to negotiate with Mexico and the FCC to make sure that we're not causing interference um, internationally. Um, so that's one of the that was one of the minor holdups that we had was um, being able to communicate that and to not so much have them give us permission, but just to make sure that when we installed our, our radios, that the down tilt was 
enough to not bleed over and not to cause interference um, on the other side. So just wanted to point that out because I know that there are some tribes that um, are in the same situation, not a whole lot, but there's that. But as far as, um, you know, future projects for us, um, you know, as we do use this for redundancy, you know, in the interim and, and going forward, one of our final phases is going to be the mobility portion of it, not like um, Spaghi had mentioned that he has, you know, three carriers. We also have cell phone carriers um, here, but we want it to, in, in our fourth and final phase of, you know, just bringing this all together um, when fiber is built is to have a mobility component that when our tribal members or our customers leave their village and go into another village or are traveling within the reservation, that their connection is continuous, that it's not just there in the home or in the community, but they're able to move with it. And we've negotiated with, um, so some of the, the self, well, not some, all of the cell phone towers are owned um, and maintained by the cellular companies, but we've negotiated, you know, the top five of the tower or, you know, a certain uh, footage on the tower so that we're able to put radios and then be able to connect in the end our tribal members so that when they're traveling anywhere on a reservation, they're still connected. So futuristically, that's what our plan is to kind of bring this all together. Great. And Spaggy, is there anything else that you're thinking about right now in terms of looking ahead? Um, not with the 2.5, um, other than just like, it, it's the same build. It just, it enables so many other things. I guess one of the big considerations is do I go with 5G, which is a little bit newer, or do I stay with LTE with the 2.5 frequency because it's more compatible uh, with a lot more devices? And um, given the fact that it's going to take some time to get that build, um, maybe 5G will be more commonplace then, but, um, yeah, not, not too much with the 2.5 at least. Thank you. All right. So now we have some time for questions. We have a few in the chat. Um, the, our first is from Sean and he asks, can you share a bit about how you troubleshoot and network issues? So anyone can jump in here. I'll, I'll start. So um, we have a network operations center um, within um, our company that if there's um, issues with cellular telephone internet, um, they are able to go in and um, help the customers troubleshoot without having to do truck rolls. We are, um, like I said, we, we are primarily, um, we are by cells on the wireless site, but on the telephone side, our transport is Calix. So we're able to intertwine and be able to look at some of the equipment and try to troubleshoot without having to do a truck roll. And it's been very successful. And also to help the consumers, um, on the other hand, hand, walk them through it to be able to understand, you know, what their their issues are um, or their troubles are and being able to be self-serving. Um, a lot of it's just um, not understanding and being afraid of technology. But once we're able to walk them through, you know, their tribal members, we're tribal members, you know, just being, you know, and, and it's not that they pass through a whole lot of um, robotics or, you know, automated stuff, you know, they're talking to hum, you know, to humans and our neighbors or, you know, relatives that work here. And so we try to make it comfortable. And then we do, um, and have started an outreach where we're able to go out and, and work with them and do one-on-one -on -one with them and explain the different uses, you know, because a lot of times when they call, they're like, you know, my Wi-Fi is not working. Um, it's a, it's a very generic term. And then for us to be able to know how we work through it, um, we, we need them to understand, you know, or, or be able to explain to us what exactly it is that they're going through. But our network operation um, staff, you know, they, they work really hard to pull this together and to um, explain and help the customers um, figure this out. But we, we do have, we have a lot of um, 
alarms. We have a lot of um, notifications. We have a lot of systems, you know, working on this to keep an eye out. Like, hey, you know, the 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 power is going lower. There's a power outage. You know, we're running on battery. You know, and and then in the consumer, you know, is is the modem good? Um, you know, there's there's just so many things that we've been able to utilize on the telephone side and bring in the into the wireless side that makes it easier for us. And I know that, you know, we're very fortunate to have that where others are still building upon that. So that's that's me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, how we troubleshoot our network is um, the and there's there's I guess different three different types of networks in this setup. There's the, the backhaul network to get the data from A to B. There is the, um, I guess, the core network of how you get it from your network core to a site of distribution. And um, sometimes that can be the same location, but in some cases you have remote sites. And so you have to troubleshoot that transit from, from your core to a distribution site. And the last is the custom uh, from your distribution to the customer's place. And I guess if, if you if you want to do managed services, you can also do the customer's Wi-Fi as well. Um, but we've uh, we didn't have um, a whole lot of funding in the beginning of our projects, so we actually went the open source route and we installed um, an open source uh, network monitoring system called Libre NMS. And it utilizes um, SNMP, um, Simple Network Management Protocol. Um, and it basically takes um, metrics that are on your equipment and sends it back to this single location so that you can monitor um, uh, the stats for all of your equipment. It, also implemented a service called Graylog, and Graylog um, takes all the log files that are on your equipment and sends it back to the same location, and it lets you analyze it um, for any kind of um, preemptive thing, like oh, you're having some packet loss due to some some issue, and it will report that that's happening, so that you can then go and see why that's happening. So with those two tools, that's how we pretty much mon manage the kind of the backfall network and from core to the distribution. Um, most systems from distribution to the customer come with their own interface and we primarily use Cambium, but I've taken a look at another program called Telrad and um, it's a different manufacturer and Ubiquity. Um, those three systems have uh, central management, a single pane of glass for that distribution network that you can use to troubleshoot. Um, and we try and do things, uh, we don't really do managed services. So we, we're not, I know that we're, we've been looking into Calyx and Adtran and different um, fiber, I guess, um, solutions, and they come with a package to where you can help the home customer out with their Wi-Fi and you get real-time stats on that. But for our network right now, we don't have that. So um, we rely on those two systems to monitor and troubleshoot the network, but uh, we try and do everything remotely. So we set up SSH and VPN so that we can remote into certain systems. And um, that way we can uh, get access, like if we're on vacation or something, because um, we were at the, I was at the Aquasasne uh, Mohawk um, boot camp, and we did have an outage there. And I was in New York, and you know we're in California, so I was able to remote in and try and help out um, because we set it up that way. But um, yeah, so so ours was pretty tedious though because um, if you get paid services, a lot of the lessons learned are baked into the solution. Whereas with open source, you have to figure out how you want to configure it yourself. Um, one of our consultants uh, through Amarin said it's called knock foo. <laughs> you got to figure out how to configure your, your knock operations, but Thank you. That, that's our troubleshooting. Thank you, Spiggy. So we have uh, two more questions. We'll try to answer them in rapid fire to the extent that we can. Um, so from Jordan, 
Could you also explain ways for tribes to acquire license spectrum if they miss the auction period? Or does anyone know alternatives or programs with the FCC? Anyone want to take that in a in a yeah. sixty second version? <laughs> I'll take it. And unfortunately, the the quick answer is no. <laughs> uh, if you miss the tribal priority window, um, then in order to get spectrum. Uh, in your area, you will have to wait for an auction and bid on on that spectrum and pay for it. There is um, growing uh, interest, political pressure to um, to change that. That all spectrum uh, cross tribal lands should belong to tribes. And I would say, if that's something that you're interested in learning more about, uh, check out Dara Blackwater. She um, She's very, uh, she's very focused on um, spectrum sovereignty, which is essentially, you know, having the spectrum available for four tribes. Thank you. So, um, all right, so we have time for one more. <laughs> Let's do this quickly. So for the Han Atham, is your utility, how is your utility structured and what approved regulatory authority status you have for the various utilities you provide. Okay, so quickly, we, um, our company provides electric, water, telephone, internet, cellular, and telephone services to all the residents. We're the one-stop shop. Um, and we are regulate on the, on the t communication side, we are an ILEC and an ET we have ETC status. Um, and we are, you know, the water and the electric is also regulated and, and operated through other managers. Um, more than that, or is that enough? That's great for now. Yeah, just so we, can, <laughs> we can finish on time. I appreciate the quick okay. responses. Um, all right. Well, I just want to thank all of you so much for your time today. It's been a really great, helpful conversation. Um, super insightful. So I just want to thank you for that. And I wanted to remind our audience that this is the second in a series of webinars. So please stay tuned through the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, whether it's Twitter X or, um, or different platforms um, for information on subsequent events. So while we focus today on wireless future events, we'll dive deeper into other subjects. So there'll be um, specific elements that are relevant for everyone. Um, this is also a reminder that a recording of today's event will live both on ILSR's YouTube and on tribalbroadbandbootcamp.org. Thank you all very much for watching and have a great rest of your day. See you next time.